So, man, let's talk. You you mentioned the elk decoy thing, but I want to talk antelope first because that's what's coming up right now. Um, I've used your decoys for all kinds of stuff over the years, and I, I want to I want to give a little a, a little asterisk to this. So, people will reach out to me and they'll say, "Hey, what decoy do you recommend? What what call? What scent? What lure? Whatever." Everybody's looking for the silver bullet. Everybody's like, hey, what's going to take me from no dead antelope to a dead antelope? And I'm always like so hesitant to I have to I have to use weasel words when I answer it because it's like, you know, I don't know how hard you hunt. I don't know where you're hunting. I don't know if you can shoot. I don't know how much effort you're going to put in. And so I'm always like hesitant to recommend stuff, but it's pretty easy to recommend Montana decoys because they're so lightweight. They're so easy to carry into a pack. And for certain situations, it is really tough to beat them. And I think I think the best learning experience, the best thing you can go through with them out in the wild is antelope during the rut. Yeah, that's just an amazing experience. And I've, I'm always perplexed that more people don't talk about antelope hunting. You know, for a guy coming from the East Coast, that's such a great gateway species to Western hunting. They're usually affordable, even if you don't go the DIY route. And they're a beautiful animal. And I mean, if you get, if you're lucky enough to get one and you do a shoulder mount or even a European mount, they're so unique and so North American that it just amazes me people don't go after them. And the meat is fantastic. It's like yeah. one of my favorite things to bring back. Me too. So, I get it totally on the the whole antelope thing. And they are, in terms of decoying, boy, they can commit and charge and they just do all these adrenaline rush things that that make it so wonderful. But I'm the president of a decoy company. I don't put a decoy out every time I go hunting. I, I mean, anybody that tells you that I think is lying because it's a tool and every job has a specific tool or tools that will work. And sometimes you're doing yourself a disservice if you're using a decoy. You've got to, it's like anything just buying a bow doesn't make you an archer. You have to put in the time and become proficient with it. And using decoys, you know, you, the more you understand animal behavior and the timing of the season to them, the rut versus the non rut, what the pressure's like, you know, what the herd dynamics are like, all those things just give you more clues as to which tool you use that day. But antelope, you know, if you hit that sweet spot in September when they're rutting, And you top a hill and there's one buck out there with a harem of does and he's already running one little buck off. That is like the perfect opportunity to creep as close as you can and pop that decoy up. I mean, it's just an amazing thing. And we've always tried to, Montana has always tried to be something different. You know, we're not just building another plastic mold decoy. We always want to do things a little bit different that fit kind of what Jerry's mentality and to a certain extent what my mentality is. And, you know, I I don't like carrying stuff. I don't like being burned down. I want to be burned down on the way out, not the way in. Yep. It's always been my philosophy. Yep. Well, so uh, let's let's back up a second here because what you're talking about is reading the situation and knowing – Hey, is this, is this the time for this tool or not? And so people think they're going to buy a decoy. They're going to go out on the prairie, see some antelope a mile away, pop that sucker up and they're going to come running. And that's not how it works. What you're talking about is, is anybody who's seen it, you know, you, you'll get this one good buck out there and he's got some does around him and the little guys will show up. They'll pop up on the, you know, random little ridges or they'll, they'll, they'll come walking in and start getting too close for his comfort. And that dude will take off and blow those little guys out. And when you can see that, it's sort of like anybody who's ever bass fished. If you've ever fished spawning bass and you flip in there, you can you can read their body language. Some of them just swim right off. Some of those males guarding a nest are going to get real ticked off and you see their fins almost start to vibrate. Mm-hmm. It's, just re- it's reading and then you know they're going to eat. But it's just reading the situation. And for... Uh, decoying that situation, it's like a matter of getting in, like you said, at least w- w- what distance would you say like is is the money distance where like if you cross this threshold and he hasn't seen you yet and you pop it up, you, you're going to probably get a response out of him. You know, the easy answer to that is probably 100 yards, I think. But, you know, some variability with the terrain and, and all that stuff. Getting Getting that close to an antelope buck with a herd is not the easiest thing in the world if you're just trying to stay covered. You got to kind of 
get lucky on the terrain and stuff like that. But I think if you can get within 100 yards and you have that situation you just described, I think that's as, about as good as you can hope for. And, and you're talking about those little bucks creeping in and popping up. It's hilarious to watch them because they're kind of doing that – I'm just walking through thing. It's like I'm not really looking at you. And then, oh, I'm going to eat right here, pause and eat for a little bit. And it's like they want to be here, but they're kind of doing like this to get there, you know. And you just see all that dynamic. And, again, that's that's antelope hunting because they inhabit somewhere that you can see all of that. Mm-hmm. You know, elk are in the timber a lot of places. Whitetails are in the woods too. So you get to see more of that interaction. I mean, I've been on hunts in the early season when you're in a ground blind, and you literally watch this herd of antelope all day long. Yep. You want to shoot yourself at the end of the day for being stuck in a blind that long, or at least I do. But it's it's just an amazing opportunity. And then you're you know you're out west. If that's the first thing you or first time you've ever hunted, it's just awesome to me. It's a beautiful it animal. Is. It is, and it's it's important to remember. So you know you might find that herd you can get to a hundred yards, but what you, you and you might not. But right. what you want to do is read the situation, and you want to employ that decoy after you've. Re- really worked your way into where you believe is as close as you're going to get. And so you see people pop up a decoy and start walking toward antelope. That doesn't work very well. It doesn't work very well. It, it probably can in certain times, but for the most part, you're going to have a low success rate. What, what happens or, you know, theoretically what happens when you, when you take the time, you use the terrain, you crawl in there, you now, now you get eyes on them and you go, okay, they're looking away or something. You get ready. Then you pop that decoy up and that buck looks and he goes, holy balls. There's a, there's a teenager right here in my front steps. Slipped in. It, it's just a slid into the DMs. I think the kids say, um, it's just like the, the, you can just see the body posture change on them. And they're like, no, no, bro, I'm coming yeah, for you. That's and not working. I, I'll tell you what, you want to circle back to missing. Um, you want to find out how you, how good you are at keeping your act together, shooting at an animal. <laughs> just wait till the first antelope comes charging in and you're like, okay, 65 yards, 23 yards. And you got to just, you got to get that shot off. It, they are easy to miss. Oh Yeah. Yeah, they're not that hard to kill, but they're easy to miss. Yeah, they are not like squirrels. Um, <laughs> squirrels are squirrels will cling to life and make you feel like you've punched your ticket to hell if you shoot them wrong. Um, <laughs> antelope, you you know you can't scare them to death, but you can get close. Um, but it's it's that it's such a cool it's such a cool opportunity. Let's talk let's talk elk, man, because this is something. I'm, I am not a good elk hunter and I have never decoyed elk before. And so th- this is something that, you know, when I was making notes about when I knew I was going to talk to you, I'm like, I w- I'm curious to hear what CJ has to say about when, when's the right time to use an elk decoy. That's like my favorite animal to hunt in the world is just elk. And I think there's a lot of guys that would say that. And, and on some days I'm, I'm kicking myself for not living out West and other days, cause I know my personality, I'm glad I don't because it's always new and I only get a little bit of it every year. And it only lasts for one month, really, if you're a bow hunter, but decoy and elk, I, I firmly believe they can be as susceptible to a decoy as antelope or anything else, much more so probably than a whitetail. I think whitetails are the toughest ones. You really got to have your act together there. But elk are, are, they're big animals. They're used to seeing other elk. They're kind of a social animal most of the time. And it's just, a, it just adds realism to a setup because you're usually calling elk. You know, most people that are employing a decoy are calling elk unless they're, you know, on a wallow or something like that or a water hole. And they've got some staked out around it like a confidence decoy. But they're an awesome, awesome animal to decoy. They're an awesome animal to hunt no matter how you do it. But Jerry and I go back and forth on it a lot. And I think it's our hunting styles are a little bit different. And and Jerry's killed some big bulls. He's definitely the elk expert. I'm just the guy out there enjoying it. But Jerry will tell you, he probably flashes decoys more than he walks up, sets them out backs off to hunt but then you get to talk to him a little bit and the first year we came out with the remef elk which is a larger cow elk decoy for us it's a little bigger than most we've had he'd set it up behind him and crept forward and was called into this bull and you know you give it enough time nothing's happening jerry's a little bit like me he doesn't like to just sit there all day and he turns around and the bull's standing by the decoy somehow it looped around behind him so it just depends on the setup but he's he's really big on trying to find the elk first show him the decoy put it away and he thinks it triggers like a curiosity i know there was a cow there i heard it i saw it so i'm coming over there to it and you know i 
we just posted a blog on montanadecoy.com about why do we make four elk decoys? Because really, you think about it, why do you need four elk decoys? That's kind of random. Well, we've got Miss September that's in a feeding or watering pose. So if you are, you know, before the rut or after the rut or whatever, that's kind of a confidence decoy. Mm -hmm. Um, We've got the RMEF elk because it's a big broadside elk, cow elk. It's visible. It's easy for them to see. Then you've got the Eichler elk that's kind of looking at you or the elk coming in and, and Fred Eichler firmly believes in that pose. And I'm not going to argue with Fred Eichler because he's killed a ton of elk too. Yep. He, he always justifies it whenever somebody asks him, he's like, what's the first thing a, a cow or a doe or anything does when another animal of their species is coming in they're looking at it. So that, yep. that's kind of what he goes to. And it, it's a, uh, and then we created the spike elk cause you know, you got those situations just like with antelope, you've got that herd bull and he's running off all these satellite bulls and, you know, an elk rack is a little bit harder to run through the woods with than a antelope buck is with horns on it. But, and a spike elk is not legal in all areas. So it's kind of a little bit more of a safety factor there, but you're trying to hit different triggers and it, we're talking about elk, but it applies to everything. Yeah. You're trying to hit different triggers to cause a reaction. And that reaction, if you've thought through it properly, it always ends up with getting the target animal you're after into your bow range. So yeah. That may, may mean it has to come right to the decoy. It may mean the decoy is behind you and you shoot it as it goes by you. It just depends on the, the situation. And again, reading the animal. If I get asked, all right, I've only got one decoy. Which one am I going to take with me? You know, it probably, you're going to know where you're hunting. If you're hunting in Colorado in the high country or if you're hunting some more open area in Wyoming, you know, you can kind of figure on those things. What's going to be the most important element? A lot of times it's just, I need something I can easily carry. Because I'm, you know, I got a 60 pound pack on going in already. So maybe I'll go with the Eichler elk and just take the strings and not even use leg poles because I know I'm in a brush or tree area. Yep. There's a lot of little nuances to it. Well, yeah. And, it, you know, that's always a consideration when you're elk hunting. I mean, it, every every ounce matters. But the, what you're talking about with the four different offerings, the the most, the easiest way to, you know, maybe maybe get everyone to understand why that matters is if you think about whitetail hunting and you think about the decoys we had access to, you know, 15, 20 years ago, your typical full body decoy, plastic, um, head up, dough, ears up, you know, eyes wide open, that decoy soured a lot of people, including myself, on decoying for a long time because it looked like it was signaling a high alert doe and all the other deer that looked at it go well, okay what's 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 gotten her cry why are her undies in a bunch because i don't like that look at all yeah and then just the difference uh of that kind of decoy versus like a whitetail head down decoy the response is incredibly different and, I and, think it's a curiosity thing too, because is that deer feeding on something I don't know about? Is that a doe? Is that a young buck? You know, maybe they can't tell that from where they are. So it just invokes a, I need more information. Oh, uh, it does. And it, you know, not only that, it gives you a chance to call because they don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you want to grunt or bleed or whatever, they just, they just know they see a deer over there and there's something, you know, anybody who's been bow hunting a while knows very rarely is the first deer that goes by the big one. You know, and if, if mama goes out with her twins and she's in the field and she's happy, or there's a lone doe out there, you see the floodgates open up, mm-hmm. but you know, like, but if that deer is real cagey and run around out there and doesn't like it, the the whole situation changes. And I really think, you know, I've, I've had a lot of situations early season using some of your past decoys where I'd put them out in a bean field because, you know, there's 200, 300 yards where these deer could come out and I want them here. And, right. you know, it might not be super callable. And so a head down decoy in the, or a natural non alert, like non uh, super worried looking doe decoy, they'll come out those, those mature does, they'll come out, they'll look at it for a while and go, I wonder what she's up to. And then you just see it just switch. And all of a sudden they go to feeding and almost always it's just in your direction. And it's like, they're just going to go over, check that dough out. And it's, it's crazy how often that works in situations where it's not the rut. It's not, you know, it's not that typical time where you're putting the buck out and you're hoping another buck who's all charged up on testosterone comes in and crab walks his way in and rolls Mm -hmm. his eyes. I mean, there's, there's a lot to that interaction, which makes them so cool. I like sitting in the woods with the decoy. I think most people think 
of fields and big openings when they're talking about decoys, but sometimes in the woods, you know, if it's a great big around here where I hunt great big white Oak flat or something, you know, those deer are just almost aimlessly moving through hitting whatever trees dropping at that time. And so you pop a decoy up. If I know the wind direction and I kind of have an idea of the bedding area, I pop the decoy up behind me and I'm just pulling them a little bit closer. And let's face it, I need them a lot closer to me with my (laughs) stick bow than you do, but I just need to pull them a little closer, more alter, alter their travel route more than really expect them to walk right up to it on any given time. And I also, I'll tie a pull-up rope to my decoy. And if the deer is coming where I want him to go and it looks good, then that's great. But if he's drifting off or he's too far out, I've got my pull-up rope to it. Of course, ours are too deep. They're laying down flat. He'd about have to step on it to see it. And then you could just pull it up, make a grunt, make a bleat, do whatever you want to do. And he's got, you know, it's visual confirmation if he's not coming already. And it's a, Mm -hmm. it's a safe way to deploy it. It's not stuck out there 20 yards in front of you and you can't get rid of it if you don't want it there. Yep. Yeah. That situation sucks when you start seeing the negative reaction to it because you're using it wrong and you're like, well, now what do I do? Do I get down? Do I go over? And you know, it's, it's dynamic. I remember uh, Mike Strandlin, the the former editor of Bowhunting World telling me that he wanted to build decoys like yours that had a string so he could just pop them up when he wanted to and drop them down if the situation wasn't right. And his, you know, his idea, if I remember correctly, was, you know, you see that cruising buck and it's the right one. You want to pop that thing up and he's going to look over when you're calling or whatever. But if it's does coming through or little bucks or something that you just want to keep going through naturally, you leave that sucker laying on the ground. Exactly. Exactly. So there, there, there's a lot to it. You guys also have the, you know, the, the decoy I get asked about a lot is the, the moo cow decoy. Um, the, 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 you know, that one is people think, you know, oh, there's mule deer, there's, you know, everywhere you go on a national forest, there's cows, um, and, you know, antelope you see in, in, in with the cattle all the time. And they think that's the one that they're going to get that's, you know, they're going to pop that sucker up and they're just going to walk right to that 80 inch goat, run an arrow behind his shoulder and be done for the day. But it's not so simple, is it? Most of the time it's not, you know, never say never. And that has worked before, but you've just got to pick your pace. Cows don't just walk sideways straight up to a antelope buck standing there. So you got to be patient and zigzag, just like those little bucks we're doing, we're talking about, you know, you're kind of feeling your way in and letting them get comfortable with where you are before you go to the next place. But that, that moo cow is, uh, it's one of those decoys that I chuckle at every time it comes up because we sell a ton of them and we sell them to people, antelope hunting, elk hunting, mule deer hunting, turkey hunting, waterfowl hunting, whatever, you know, people love them and they're great. But we used to make it in a black cow and everybody wanted a brown or a red cow. So we make a red cow. Now all I hear about is why'd you get rid of the black cow? It's like, I can't win. And if I had two skews like that, it would, it's, it just wouldn't be worth it. We don't sell that many of them, but it's interesting. And then you get the guy that's like, why do you make a cow decoy? Is there wild cattle somewhere? Well, yeah, probably in Texas, but that's not really what it's meant for. And that thing's huge. You know, you and I could get behind it and we're completely yep. covered. It's got the little view through screen in it. It's a great, I call it almost a stalking shield or, or mobile yep. blind. But it's not as, it's not going to be as simple all the time of pop the thing up, walk straight at it, shoot him at 20 yards, you know? Yep. Yeah. You got to think about how. You how also want to make move. sure the bull's not in the pasture too. <laughs> that's, that's an excellent point. Um, I'll have to check and see how good of insurance we have on this podcast before we <laughs> offer up advice on uh, get in there with him. He'll be fine. He, w- he won't even pay any attention to this moo cow thing. I swear you won't get gored. Um, <laughs> I've tried that walk straight at them or kind of meander your way in. Sometimes it works. Sometimes, especially if the if it, you got like antelope that are feeding and mm-hmm. they can kind of like, but a lot of times they'll just keep that little buffer zone. But a, like a bedded one, he, you know, he's like, oh, I don't, I don't like the way that cow's moving. But, you know, anybody who's spotted and stalked enough knows, you know, you spot that antelope out there, you spot that mule deer, whatever. We've used them for pigs too, actually, but you, you will go, okay, here's my route. Here's the wind. This is what I'm going to do. And then you get to a spot that's, you know, 400 yards or 800 yards from where you left and you go, oh, I ran out of cover and I need to get across this to that next mm-hmm. patch of cover. And for us, that was when the cow decoy came in and we could just pop that sucker up, crawl across there, whoop, fold it right back up. And we've gotten through a place that you wouldn't get through any other way. You'd be and, hung you know, up. 
Yeah, and it's just it like it's like a little uh connection to the next cover a lot of times because you're not using it uh, to go at your target animal a lot of times you're just Ooh. using it to like oh i gotta bridge this gap or get to the other side of this draw or there's just a big gap between these cedars and i need to go from here to there and it's it's a really good option in you know pinion um, badlands type cover breaks there's 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 some places where that's freaking deadly if they're if the animals you're after are used to cattle which they usually are that's a great point you know that type of country you may have to backtrack a mile to get around if you can property lines everything like that all of our decoys to me the one thing i've always tried to do is is we make them purpose built and we really talk about that more with like the freshman whitetail buck but they're purpose built which is also why we have so many we don't just have a deer decoy and an elk decoy we have several different versions because they're purpose built for a certain scenario a certain time of year or something like that and the freshman i'm jumping around here but that freshman buck he's got a a, a two-year-old body you know his stomach is up and and he's long and lean and he's got this little small rack but his head his nose is down his ears are laid back he's forehead forward he's in an angry aggressive posture so that that's a decoy that you know it's best used during that peak time when they're when they're battling and all the great things are going on in the in the early pre-rut to me but that's not maybe the decoy i want to put out to do your scenario of in the beans it just would be an odd thing so our, our decoys are purpose built and you have to think about that a little bit in my opinion, depending on the season, et cetera, and stuff like that. But I mean, you can name a decoy and I'll tell you why it's built that way. We always yeah. try to think through that. How about the deer rump? See, that's just a great one. That's a perfect decoy for the guy that hates to carry stuff. It folds up so small. It's got the teaser tail on it, which gives it a little motion in the wind. It's the one I do that hanging it out, out of my stand technique with, and it just lives in my day pack 99 percent of the season it's back there it may never come out on two or three hunts but it's always there you can even run it with one leg pole if you're really a minimalist and it's again it goes to that you know its head's not down it's kind of away in a sort of a relaxed cock geared kind of pose that's like i'm just hanging out here doing my thing mm -hmm. so that's a decoy you could use most any time of the year but the size of it and things like that it just lends itself well to packability. That was kind of the main thing behind that one. I am, uh, I'm getting ready. I'm basically packed up here to, to head out to Nebraska for their opener and, and do, uh, do a little whitetail hunt down there on some public land. And I have one of those pack cause I keep thinking about some of the, I'm, I'm going to be hunting some pretty wide open stuff mm. and I'm going to be in some natural blinds and some sketchy setups and so I'm I'm bringing one along just in case I need to buy myself a little bit more ability to move. Mm -hmm. You know, if you put that up, they kind of don't get the movement behind it as easily or as a confidence thing on some of the water I plan on hunting. And, you know, to, to your point about the, the timing and what, what's... What what serves best or not? I mean, I also used the decoys last year in uh, Oklahoma on public land during the rut, and so it's it's a pretty versatile, pretty lightweight, awesome kind of uh, option for a lot of different setups. And it's just so easy to carry. Yes. And if you're That's, a scent guy, you know, there's legalities. You got to check on that now with CWD and all that stuff. But, you know, if you're mm -hmm. a scent guy, you can put it on that tail. And at the end of the hunt, chunk the tail, pick you up a couple more of those before your next hunt. And you're not riding around with a decoy that smells horrible. Yeah. I'm, I, uh, <laughs> I, I use scents randomly sometimes during the rut, you know, but man, I can spill a bottle of dope piss in my truck. <laughs> like it's nobody's business. And I have done it a couple times where, you know, like the back seat, like the bench seat where I'll set like a bottle of dopey down and I haven't screwed on the cap correctly and it'll tip over and run in between the, oh my God. <laughs> that is awful. It is awful. Um, I did, I, I, <laughs> I busted a bottle in my uh, my uh, mud room one time, and my wife discovered it and was not oh, that happy with me. Gosh! So I've basically, some... anybody that's deer hunting with you needs to make sure you're driving your truck, not yes. not, not in theirs at all. My, there's always some kind of nastiness going on in Ugh. there. There's something spilled or some dead critter got you know some feathers I brought for my girls or something like that. <laughs> 
Uh, there's all kinds of stuff. So, CJ, we've gone through a lot of different things uh, with some of these decoys, some of the some of the hunting strategies. Um, you, so I, I want to explain something quick. So this is not a sponsored thing. CJ is a friend of mine. Um, we aren't, we aren't taking any sponsorship. We're not doing any of that stuff for this podcast or my other podcasts for a while. We're building an audience and I wanted you to come on because I knew you'd be able to talk decoys and I use your decoys a lot. Um, but you, you offered up something to the listeners that I want them to know about, um, in case they like anything that we've had to say. So can you let them know what that is? Absolutely. Um, it's, uh, it's a code that's good on our website, montanadecoy.com, and it's hunt for real 19 all caps on hunt for real and the number 19, and it's a 30% off code, and you can use it on any decoy you want to try. So if anything we've talked about here sparked an interest or something you've been thinking about but weren't real sure about, now would be a great time to do it because that's a pretty good discount for us. 